This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Next up is my co-moderator, Dr. Riley, professor of surgery here at UCSF, who will address the issue of spinal cord ischemia after thoracic aneurysm repair, risk stratification, and prevention. Uh, thank you. Um, the title of my talk would imply that we actually know how to prevent spinal cord ischemia, and I would suggest that if we knew that, we would all be uh, far happier than we currently are when facing the treatment of patients with thoracic or thoracoabdominal aneurysms. I'm actually going to uh, focus on thoracic aneurysms here and leave as much as I can thoracoabdominals out of it, though be the way the data are presented in the literature, that's a little bit hard, as you'll see. So uh, spinal cord ischemia is obviously an enormously uh, devastating complication for a patient and also for the treating team. It's a little hard to feel particularly victorious that you've excluded the aneurysm when the patient can no longer walk. The implications of spinal cord ischemia are not subtle either. Patients who have spinal cord ischemia have a lower survival overall, which you see in these, uh, the curve to your left or the graph to your left. And the degree of spinal cord ischemia also has an impact on the survival of the patient. So the worse the, the deficit, the greater the likelihood the patient will be dead. So it not only affects the patient, their family, everybody who treats them, but it, it kills the patients in a, at a faster rate. Some patients might say that given that complication, that's not bad, but it's certainly not what you're looking for when you set out to treat the patients. Now, intraoperative adjuncts in an attempt to avoid uh, spinal cord ischemia with open thorac thoracic aneurysm, and I put this little extra A here because some of these pertain or derive from the literature about thoracoabdominal aneurysms as well, include oversewing intercostals immediately to prevent uh, sort of a, a sump of blood away from the spinal cord, reimplanting intercostals preserving collateral roots of flow, hypogastric and left subclavian, shortening the aortic cross clam time by sewing fast, reimplanting using the Crawford technique as opposed to individual branches, left heart bypass with distal aortic perfusion, epidural cooling, CSF drainage, trying to maintain hemodynamic stability as best you can with the patient filleted from top to bottom and pumps and wires and whatnot, permissive if not active hypertension, and of course neuromonitoring in an attempt to detect a change early with the thought that that might provide an option for uh, reversal of the deficit. And I'm sure that we will hear more about the evolution and the current status of these uh, from um, Dr. Cambria later. Over the past decade, the combination of all of those events, the, the focus of this treatment in uh, centers of expertise has resulted in a reduction in spinal cord ischemia that is quite actually notable. Um, whether there is option for further reduction in open repair is something that would be interesting to hear Dr. Cambria's comments about. Those features that have been identified with some statistical significance to actually have a role in reducing spinal cord ischemia as opposed to those that are uh, utilized um, uh, sort of on an ad hoc basis or because of firm religious belief, however you want to look at it, are spinal fluid drainage, hypothermia, induced or permissive hypertension, neuroprotection, a dedicated and experienced team, and a protocol for patient management. Now, it may not actually matter which approach you take to, pr to protecting the spinal cord, but it does matter that everyone is familiar with the protocol and that the protocol and approach are consistent and the same. This is not an operation that one should or, or should want to attempt on an intermittent basis.
the, uh, the level of statistical impact of these various approaches is summarized on this slide um, from this nice review from a couple of years ago by Akers Group. And you can see that for at least open repair, anatomy and acuity are amongst the key determinants of the patient's risk for spinal cord ischemia. And unfortunately, you can't do anything about anatomy or acuity. So you can't really get the patient out of one type of, of uh, clinical circumstance. Cardiac index, you may or may not have an opportunity to improve that prior to an operation. One can use spinal fluid drainage, of course, but there's not a whole lot that you can do to overcome the predominantly important factors for the risk of spinal cord ischemia in patients undergoing open repair. Interestingly, some factors that are not consistently identified as particularly important in the development of spinal cord ischemia or that have not been shown to have statistical significance are age, renal function, aortic occlusion time, core temperature, and intercostal reimplantation. I have to comment that core temperature in this particular report might not have been important because they cool the heck out of everybody and so they can't really determine uh, what happens if you don't. Intercostal reimplantation has always been a uh, somewhat a difficult uh, uh, appro approach to determine its, ro its role. It may have a role with the more extensive aneurysms and with dissections that it doesn't have in other ones. Now, there are some obviously data limitations to these, to interpreting these results, and that is that often these reports mix acuity they mix pathology, so you're not talking about only type 1s or type 2s. You're not talking only about dissections or only about de degenerative aneurysms. There may be traumatic uh, aortic procedures thrown in there. Thoracoabdominal results are often included, and I'm trying to focus on thoracic aneurysm because that was the title of my little talk. And those, um, even though one, they may tell you what, um, within the patient group how many of each you have, the results may not be presented according to each of the patient groups. In general, though, in looking at the results, you can anticipate that the results for the thoracic aneurysms alone will be better than the mixed results of thoracic and thoracoabdominal aneurysm. That makes sense because the thoracoabdominals are much uh, more extensive. Well, what about endovascular repair? Um, has endovascular repair done anything to help in the uh, observation of the rate of spinal cord ischemia? Uh, you heard um, discussion earlier in the in uh, bl blunt aortic injury treatment that uh, endovascular repair has clearly reduced the mortality. And Dr. Weaver indicated that it has also reduced spinal cord ischemia rates. Actually, that's not as clear from all of the available data. There is at least uh, one study that demonstrated that it, um, well, I'll get, um, that demonstrated that it has, well, I'll get to that on the next slide. In these next two slides, I've actually summarized the, rate, summarized the rates of spinal cord ischemia according to the pathology. And with the, um, reports in the literature about endovascular repair, it's easier to separate out the pathology. It's not easy, but it's easier. And here you see the rates of spinal cord ischemia. Now, um, again, in this group of patients, the uh, extent of repair and the extent of the aneurysm, which I have to point out is not, is not the same thing. So with uh, endovascular approaches to treatment, you're going to be extending the length of repair of excluded aorta in comparison to what you would with open repair. So you may be converting if essentially a, sh a short repair to a much longer exclusion. Nonetheless, the, re the reported rates of spinal cord ischemia after thoracic endovascular repair for degenerative thoracic aortic aneurysms is pretty respectably low. For dissections, it's also pretty respectably low. And in one study that did actually compare this with open, rep with re open repair showed a statistically lower rate in patients treated with the endovascular approach. If you look at patients with trauma, getting back to what Dr. Weaver was talking about this morning, this is blunt aortic injury and this is rupture. Now this could be rupture from a variety of different uh, etiologies. In this case, it's all thoracic aortic ruptures, not just those related to trauma. This is only related to trauma. These are acute aortic syndromes of all different types. 
you again see that there is a, a certainly uh, low-ish rate of spinal cord ischemia, but not zero. If you compare that within the same group, uh, or the, within the same report, to the, re the incidence of spinal cord ischemia with open repair, while in many cases it, it is a little, it's lower for endovascular, it's not necessarily statistically significantly lower. Why is that? Well, it's probably because in many circumstances the clinical presentation for the trauma patients trumps the, the ability of the repair to overcome the ischemic insult. Nonetheless, there are some uh, reports that do indicate that the rate for endovascular repair for uh, acute aortic uh, circumstances is significantly less than it is for open repair. Um, now remember, we're not talking about mortality here. Mortality has clearly been shown and quite consistently to be lower for the endovascular approach for these urgent circumstances than it is uh, for open repair. What are the important factors for the development of spinal cord ischemia in patients who undergo endovascular repair of thoracic aortic conditions? Well, the length of the excluded aorta ha is significantly related to the risk of spinal cord ischemia, and depending upon which study you look at, you can come up with various measurements of what the key length is or a key cut point in the length, but the bottom line is similar to open repair. The longer the aorta you exclude, the more likely it is that you will see uh, paraplegia. Similarly, sacrificing collateral roots of flow to the spinal cord also increases the risk of uh, spinal cord ischemia. That's not rocket science. In this case, the two collateral roots that they're talking about are some part of the thoracic aorta plus either the left subclavian or the hypogastric. Replacement of the infrarenal aorta has long at concomitantly has all long been recognized as an increased uh, risk of spinal cord ischemia. The, this history of prior aortic surgery is uh, plus minus. In some series it correlates with an increased risk and in others it doesn't. Other factors that are important um, are, again, female gender, as you've heard uh, talked about, hypotension, both perioperatively, and, uh, intraoperatively, and postoperatively renal failure, the specific pathology of the aorta that you're treating almost reaches statistical significance with degenerative thoracic aneurysms ha being uh, at greatest risk for paraplegia. Iliac conduits, blood transfusions, reoperating for bleeding, and increased contrast volume probably as markers of more complicated procedures and lengthier procedures are also notable for increased risk of spinal cord ischemia. Now, what adjuncts are there that one can uh, look at for endovascular repair? Well, there's a whole lot on that long list for open repair that fall out that you simply don't have a corollary to for endovascular repair. You can, of course, preserve hypogastrics in the subclavian. You can drain the CSF. You probably have an easier time in uh, maintaining hemodynamic stability and uh, establishing hypertension, assuming the patient did not arrive hemodynamically compromised, and one can do neuromonitoring. Um, these adjuncts uh, are routinely used, and I agree with one of the earlier speakers who said that this, uh, the significance of covering the subclavian artery has probably been underestimated for lack of a sufficient follow-up. Um, an approach, approaches to hemodynamic stability, if you are doing these procedures electively, of course, is to reduce or stop antihypertensive medications preoperatively to allow permissive hypertension to develop before you start to stage procedures when one component might be an open procedure creating a conduit. This is not something that has uh, received a whole lot of attention. We began to notice it with the branch thoracos because that open exposure, the retroperitoneum, continues to ooze all during the course of the procedure. And by the time you get to the critical point, especially if it's tricky to get there, of uh, covering the aorta, the patient started to get hypotensive at exactly the long time wrong time. You can use pressors. There's a, there's a potential price for that, but you certainly can. And then it's wise to gradually reintroduce antihypertensives postoperatively and not just start them up immediately. We have semi-amusing experiences with some of our branch patients where they're fine until somebody writes their medications to start the way they were pre-op, and then they get lower extremity weakness, and then we stop them, and then somebody else writes the orders, and then they get weak again. So the gradually reintroducing it is probably a better idea. 
CSF drainage to effect and not necessarily to a specific pressure. It probably makes more sense, but you can't do this until they start to get intracranial hemorrhage. There's a lot of debate about whether or not one should routinely insert lumbar drains. So if your hospital can put in a lumbar drain in about five minutes, if you need it, then fine, you can put it in selectively. And if all of your patients are not coagulopathic, so you don't have to wait to reverse the coagulopathy, then selective use might be reasonable. But delay in treatment once the patient develops a deficit has a, negative, has a, a definite adverse effect on your ability to, to induce recovery. In comparing open thoracic uh, procedures and TVAR, Spinal cord uh, ischemia generally presents early after open procedures, meaning that the deficit is often there as soon as the patient is awake enough for you to know and for them to know whether they are paralyzed. The deficits tend to be more profound, being paraplegia, and less likely to resolve. Whereas with TVAR, they tend to be delayed onset. It may actually be the same time of onset, but the sh the, what's shorter is the time between when you finish the procedure and when the patient's awake or moving, or if they're done under local anesthesia, you can tell immediately. The deficits possibly are less profound because you're seeing it as it evolves, and therefore you have a greater likelihood to improve and resolve the deficit. The uh, options we've talked about, raising the blood pressure with volume repressors, some people give steroids, um, with endovascular, you have the option of creating or inducing an endo leak, as we did in this patient who developed paraplegia shortly within a few hours after the end of her procedure, which recurred in spite of draining CSF. And so we induced an endo leak by putting a little uh, uh, stint outside the stint graft, and you can see the endo leak around it. What's interesting is you would think that her endo leak needed to be up here somewhere to reverse her spinal cord ischemia, but it was down here, got to a big lumbar, just pushed this over enough to perfuse a big lumbar, which you can see here that steadily grew over the next few months. When we then came back and went back inside the graft, put another balloon expandable stent in and crushed our little endo leak inducer, and she remained fine. Um, and this is just a summary of, of, of that. This led to the development within the customized um, grafts of spinal perfusion cuffs, which are a way of allowing you to sort of stage the exclusion of the spinal cord. Remains to be seen whether that will have any significant impact on the risk of spinal cord ischemia or not. What's in the future? Well. Uh, this is the multi-layer stint. I don't know for those of you who haven't seen it, it's not a stint graft, it's a stint. In theory, it redirects blood flow away from aneurysms and preserves branches and has been proposed as a stint that you can put across any branch anywhere, excluding aneurysm flow but preserving the branch. Now, this is an example of use in a common iliac aneurysm where it was put across the orifice of the internal. To my way of thinking, right here looks like thrombus in the internal, but at any rate, and I think they thought the same thing, so I'm not sure that would be considered success. This is the example of using this in the popliteal, which excludes flow in the aneurysm. Mind now, this is not covered with anything <clears throat> and theoretically preserves branches, this little branch shooting off the side, and it's over here somewhere. I'm not sure w what this is. I can't quite decide if it's the next best thing since sliced bread or the next biggest con that, we, that has been seen for a long time. There are some people who would say that there's been a version of this before and it didn't work then and it won't work now, but it is something to uh, keep an eye on. In any event, this is our goal, the empty wheelchair. We are not there yet, and it will be a notable achievement when we finally can get there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Riley.